Okay, I guess we are live. Welcome everyone. Uh, so this is a special event organized by the Finnish Museum of Games, uh, an anniversary talk. So Finnish Museum of Games is having its fifth birthday now. And last year we organized the first um, lecture in the series with Henry Lowood. Uh, both lectures, the one from the year before and today's lecture, will be available on uh, Suom and Peli Muzo, the Finnish Museum of Games uh, YouTube channel. Uh, but let's uh, speak about our uh, today's uh, guest. Uh, we are very happy to have Melanie Swallow here. Welcome, Melanie, from Australia. Melanie is a professor of digital media heritage at Swinburne University of Technology, Melbourne. Uh, her research focuses on the creation, use, preservation and legacy of complex digital artifacts, such as video games uh, and media artworks. And today, Melanie has a special talk for us because her latest book, uh, published with MIT Press uh, Games and History series, uh, called Homebrew Gaming and the Beginnings of Vernacular Digitality is out. And we are very happy to have you here and hear more about your research on that topic. Melanie, I leave you the floor. Thank you so much, Maria. And um, thank you so much to people from the Finnish Games Museum, Nicholas and Uti, for the invitation to present to you today um, and for organising this opportunity. It's really lovely to be with you. I'm coming to you from Melbourne, Australia, and I'd like to start by offering what we call an acknowledgement of country, acknowledging that I'm on the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders, past and present. I'd also like to recognise any First Nations people who are present and acknowledge their continuing custodianship of land and culture. Okay, so I think of digital games as artifacts from the road to our becoming digital in a long 1980s decade. So the book that I've published last year um, in August it came out is about games and the development of games, but it's about more than that. It's about a time and a journey and about the way that we perceive both of those things and the way that our disciplines help to form a view of our condition of becoming digital. This book is based on extensive textual, archival and interview research. It addresses the time when microcomputers, or just micros, were new in the late 1970s and early 1980s. Micros were both small and inexpensive compared to their mini computer siblings. Low-end, cheap, 8-bit machines offered many their first taste of computing 
and many people wrote their own programs, often teaching themselves how to code from a book or a magazine and experimenting with what it was possible to code. The arrival of these 8-bit microcomputers, systems such as the TRS and System 80s, the Sinclair, Atari, Micro-B and Commodore Rangers, heralded the moment when computers came within reach of lay people. The development of games by users for these systems, termed homebrew games, was a significant use of early computers. It was a time when it was possible for one person to envisage, plan and execute a computer game, doing the graphics, sound and coding themselves. Imagine you've never had the chance to use a computer, which until then would have been mostly limited to people in labs and banks and universities. Suddenly, they become within reach of everyday people. It's a significant moment when computers first enter the home, yet it has been largely overlooked. Rather than pick on a particular section or chapter or argument from the book to talk about today, I thought I'd try to offer a high-level overview of some aspects of what I've tried to do in the book from a couple of angles. First of all, the disciplinary contexts that I'm drawing on and addressing, which are spread throughout, but which come up particularly in the introduction and in Chapter 5. And then the homebrew phenomenon as an aspect of ordinary culture, which I draw from Michel de Zoteau and deliberate on largely in Chapter 3. I'll talk a little about these two angles before turning to one of my informants to illustrate the ordinariness, if you like, of homebrew game development, an example that I unpack in the book where I discuss some of the games of Nicholas Morentes, whose artwork is also on the book's cover. So these are kind of meta themes, if you like. So to start with the disciplinary contexts, I'm engaging with media history, understood as a subfield of media studies, rather than what sometimes happens when I go to media history conferences here. You know, I'm stuck with papers um, about dead newspaper proprietors. So media history as a subfield of media studies, also computer history and cultural history. What about gang history? Well, of course, I engage with gang history now in its current form and, and have been over the years in its nascent form. But gang history barely existed when I started this work. Um, which initially started uh, right back in 2004 when I first moved to New Zealand um, for my first full-time academic job and I was asked to look into the history of games in New Zealand. Um, and I vividly remember trying to pitch projects and panels and, and nobody kind of could understand why and if this would be of interest. So I said that homebrew has largely been overlooked. Let me talk about that. But first let me define what I'm talking about when I'm talking about homebrew. These are some characteristics um, that I uh, associate with homebrew, my definition, if you like. The games were made in domestic space rather than any kind of institutional space. The creators were largely self-taught programmers. Most, were made, most games were made by one person. Games were often not published, but if they were, distribution was usually local, small scale, and productions were often marked by an experimental ethic. So games were overlooked? Well, why? Well, there were a range of reasons. Um, this is quite recent history. It's fair to say, I think, that um, it hasn't really been considered worthwhile uh, by many people. Um, a there are discourses of delegitimation at play, um, including uh, that, you know, microcomputers were seen as toys by some people. And there are geographic differences going on. Um, homebrew game production happened in the private space of the home, and so it wasn't always obvious. Uh, and to date, computer history, um, one of the institutional kind of scholarly disciplines that I've uh, rooted myself in, has shown little interest in the ordinary, the popular and the vernacular. Here's an example of that from Martin Campbell Kelly's 2003 book, From Airline Reservations to Sonic the Hedgehog. He says the lack of significant barriers to entry led to the phenomenon of the quote-unquote bedroom coder. Thousands of would-be software tycoons began to write games in their spare time, selling their programs through small ads and computer magazines. The typical game cost $15 and consisted of a smudgy photocopied sheet of instructions and a tape cassette or a floppy disk in a plastic bag. Most of the programs were disappointing to their purchases. And, uh, you know, he wasn't wrong about much of the packaging, 
for um, homebrew games, but I think he misses the point. And to, to focus on um, the packaging that a game comes in is to miss the point, especially um, at this time. What, what other reasons are there for why um, homebrew has been overlooked? Well, I argue that media studies carries a legacy bias towards the screen and interpretation rather than making. And cultural studies and now fan studies, despite having a long interest in the everyday consumption, reception and amateur making, has had a tendency to treat the internet, the coming of the internet as a watershed moment when fan practices start to become digital, which has meant that they've neglected earlier precursors such as the long 1980s decade, which is what interests me. Things have been changing, of course. Um, until recently, game history has, however, been console and arcade heavy. But I want to acknowledge um, you know, some important uh, recent titles to come out in game history, uh, amongst them uh, scholarly end of things, uh, Yaroslav Svelch's Game in the Iron Curtain, of course, also in the Game History series from MIT Press. Um, Alison Gazard, um, Now the Chips Are Down, about the um, BBC um, micro, uh, Graham Kirkpatrick's work, uh, Tom Lean's Electronic Dreams, and Alex Wade's Playback, um, plus many scholarly articles and chapters. I'm not going to cite them all. And there's also been some uh, enthusiast histories, uh, such as of the Commodore 64, Commodore by Rob O'Hara and Terrible Nerd by Kay Savets, for example. So um, my study is based on work that I've done specifically in the context of Australia and New Zealand, um, where micros were a significant part of the gaming ecology, um, much like is acknowledged by the scholarship in Europe and the UK. But I do try to put in the, in the book the Australasian case study studies more accurately in larger international context. Um, and I do acknowledge that popularity of other types of early systems for digital gameplay, like arcades and consoles that plug into the TV, outweighed games on micros in many places. Yet I am still left asking, why has there been so little um, out of the US in particular on micros? It's genuinely perplexing to me. There is ample archival evidence of the importance of microcomputers in North America. Enthusiasts clearly did the same things or similar things in the US as elsewhere. Um, I have found homebrew games in the Stephen Cabernetti collection, for instance, at Stanford University. And the West Coast computer fairs were billed as, quote, exclusively devoted to home and hobby computing, end quote. So there was clearly a lively hobby computer scene going on without even going to the kind of particular what went on in the garages of Silicon Valley. Um, the PBS uh, channel had their own TV show, The Computer Chronicles. It ran between 1983 and 2002. And there's many other similarities. You know, there were plenty of dedicated computer and game magazines featuring type-in code for games. Some differences too. Um, for instance, um, mini computers were not widely um, accessible in Australia, so they're not a big part of our history. But Ahara and Savetsa's account I mention here because they are written from a US perspective. Um, so this stuff did happen in the States, yet it hasn't been picked up by many North American scholars. Um, and micros are therefore largely missing from US game history, which is an odd omission given that it's such a large and important market. So I raise this, I suppose, um, to say that I'm interested in asking um, in a broader kind of way what game history can be. And noticing the gaps and the omissions is a part of that. I seem to play that role from time to time um, of an outsider voice uh, that hopefully leads to some new questions being asked, something that I theorise uh, in the book in terms of, um, you know, upsetting orthodoxies. Um, something that I talk through uh, these, these issues in the introduction. So on the one hand, we have media histories, computer history, and now game history um, in terms of the scholarly kind of situation um, that this book uh, pops up in. And on the other hand, I'm engaging with discourses and disciplinary contexts that come from fan studies, media studies, which 
came out of film and TV, cultural and literary studies. Fan and user making more specifically, and the scholarship on everyday life. I thought I'd just um, make the, the segue to um, those disciplines and what they have to say about users. And that it's actually um, use, users and use have been uh, a subject of interest for a very long time um, in these disciplines, comparatively speaking. So um, as Nellie Oudshorn and Trevor Pinch noted in their introduction to How Users Matters, how users matter. Um, you know, those who do cultural and media studies have focused primarily on users and consumers. Um, scholars have acknowledged the importance of studying users from the very beginning in these disciplines. Often in the academy, this comes um, under the guise of audience studies. And so I'm telling you this because I, um, as, as, my, as part of my theoretical uh, framework, the major theorist whose work I use in the Homebrew book is um, that of Michel de Citeau, French historian, a particularly de Citeau's concept that user making is a kind of production. So in The Practice of Everyday Life, Volume 1, de Citeau makes a remarkable distinction when he talks about um, production and the uses that are made of products by users who are not producers. The idea is akin to what we might think of as consumption, but lacks the pejorative connotations that term often has in consumer capitalism. Whilst this formulation, consumption as a form of production, is admittedly paradoxical, it's useful in that it facilitates inquiry into practices that are often passed over because they're not immediately obvious. And here's a quote um, from the general introduction uh, where de Sato writes, the making in question is a production, a poesis, but a hidden one because it is scattered over areas defined and occupied by systems of production. And because the steadily increasing expansion of those systems no longer leaves consumers any place in which they can indicate what they make or do with the products of these systems. The terms in which de Sato describes consumption in this introduction have always resonated deeply with me. But they've also seemed slightly at odds with the rest of his book. Most of the chapters feature a strong emphasis on language and reading, their relation to orality and a scriptural economy, and enunciation. Indeed, de Soto's collaborator, Luce Giard, calls reading a central paradigm. So I've always found it curious that the, this idea of consumption as a form of production seems to have so much potential, didn't get greater attention. Indeed, it's not until chapter 12, called Reading as Poaching, which is the metaphor, of course, that Henry Jenkins will borrow for his fan studies book, Textual Poachers, published in 1992. It's not until this chapter 12 that there's much focus on consumption at all. And so the ways that de Soto has been taken up by scholars have only seemed to confirm to me anyway what a missed opportunity this is. His distinctions between strategies and tactics often gets invoked, along with his work on walking through the city and the concern with escaping a rationalising and panoptic gaze, ideas that bear an obvious echo, as Giard says, to the work of Michel Foucault. But audiences, along with creating culture and making their own interpretations of texts, are also literally makers, a point that has been obscured, I think, in cultural and media studies appropriation of the Soto, which has largely focused on audience interpretation of texts, often from popular or mass culture. And so I've admired those studies that seem to have gestured towards productive consumption and interpreted the French verb faire not only metaphorically, but also as approaching something more literal, as making. Nevertheless, I've always found that the deep meditations and the case studies fleshing this part of de Soto's thinking out seem to be missing. And so I felt it was timely um, to reapproach this scholarship uh, more than 40 years after it first appeared in a report to the French government and almost 40 years after the first volume of Art d'Affaires was translated into English, um, which 
has largely come to define the reception of de Soto in the Anglophone Academy. It's meant that volume two of The Practice of Everyday Life has received very little attention. A book that came from the same 19, late 1970s project that he conducted with Pierre Mayol and Louis Giard. And so in chapter three of the book, I try to reconstruct why this happened. And I ended up having to consult several books to piece it together, um, as best I can as a, as a non-Francophone uh, reader. Um, as best I can glean, volume two of The Practice of Everyday Life was deemed to be too French. And so it wasn't translated into English until 1998, which is really quite late, if you think that um, Jenkins' textual poachers and Fisk's prior work also, you know, is out in the early 90s. Okay, so my argument is that the microcomputer user and homebrew game developer constitute some of the best examples of the insight that users and consumers are makers and producers of ordinary culture. It is ordinary digital culture we're talking about when we talk of making homebrew, vernacular digitality. Making computer games is a popular activity amongst computer hobbyists, but it is not popular culture per se. Many of the games were never published or distributed beyond the local, while lots of titles were never finished or even played by anyone. And so I deploy specific ideas from Mayol, Giard and De Soto's scholarship to analyse aspects of 1980s microcomputing and homebrew development practice. In particular, I focus on the local orientation of practice and cooking as an analogy for users' experimentation to offer a detailed excavation of homebrew practice. Despite the very specific emphases of Mayol and Giard in their accounts of ordinary French people's everyday practices of shopping, cooking and urban life in the 1970s, and despite Giard's acknowledgement in 1994 that certain practices have already receded from us, many of the central themes of Volume 2 are surprisingly relevant and even applicable to 1980s homebrew game development and computing in the home. And I think one reason for this is um, and one reason why homebrew um, has largely been overlooked is its everydayness, its homeliness, its ordinariness, its ordinariness. It wasn't glamorous and it wasn't spectacular. Um, and this fits with a distinction that the Sato and Giard draw uh, between mass and ordinary or everyday culture, which helps to tease apart some of the different contexts in which making is deployed. So they write, for instance, and I'm quoting, mass culture tends towards homogenization, the law of wide scale production and distribution. Ordinary culture hides a fundamental diversity of situations, interests, and contexts under the apparent repetition of objects that it uses. Pluralization is born from ordinary usage, from this immense reserve that the number and multiple of differences constitute. And they go on to say, we know poorly the types of operations at stake in ordinary practices, their registers and their combinations, because our instruments of analysis, modelling and formalisation were constructed for other objects and with other aims, end quote. So I think this is kind of resonant of the point I made at the outset, that, you know, this is a, a very interdisciplinary project, um, it's at the juncture of a whole lot of different um, ways of thinking about uh, phenomena um, and none of them really quite gets it. And so it takes all these different disciplinary perspectives in order to arrive at a, at a full and rich account of what homebrew is. So what does all this matter? What is the significance of homebrew activity? Well, the Soto clearly envisages everyday practice as having a political dimension along with other foundational texts from the Birmingham and Frankfurt schools, Prisato's scholarship has helped to shape cultural and media studies attention to the politics of cultural practice. Prisato and Giard articulate what is at stake in ordinary culture via three interlinked terms, the polemical or political, the aesthetic and the ethical. Of the polemical, they write, 
and I quote, to appropriate information for oneself, to put it in a series and to bend its montage to one's own taste is to take power over a certain knowledge and thereby overturn the imposing power of the ready-made and pre-organised to trace one's own path through the resisting social system, end quote. The aesthetic, they say, is about, quote, opening up a unique space within an imposed order, end quote. And as for the ethical, it's about, quote, defending the autonomy of what comes from one's own personality, end quote. So my interviews with 17 informants, um, eight from New Zealand, eight from Australia, and uh, Bob Smith from the UK, um, hi, Bob, if you're out there, um, offered me many opportunities to see these aspects of the rewards of ordinary culture and making in the stories and the accounts of people who made homebrew games in the 1980s and some who continue to make homebrew games today. And I riff on many of them in the book. The satisfaction of getting the computer to perform as they envisaged it, the pleasures of being able to create something, etc. cetera. Uh, one uh, Australian game developer who's a, a well-known name um, is John Passfield, and he cut his teeth um, coding in the 1980s, and he had this to say. He said, I've always liked games and making games. I've got little board games which I made up. So the computer was an extension of that. And I loved storytelling too. A big thing for me was creative writing as a kid. But that's, I think, one of the reasons why I did the Star Trek game. It's a story. It's a narrative about escaping a spaceship that's going to blow up and the little chances that, you know, you type things in the computer and it gives you a bit of story back. And that was probably, again, that idea of creating stuff, which is what I loved, making something original and putting my own spin on things. Some homebrew games were ordinary in that they were literally based on people's everyday life experience. And I wanted to um, share these lovely photos with you um, of one of my informants, Nicholas Morentes, uh, with some of his handwritten code that he wrote in chemistry class in school. And I love this uh, photo. It was taken in probably 2015. You know, this is uh, a good 35 years after um, this work was done and just the look on his face, you know, it's, it's a beautiful um, showing of the work that he did. Um, so he, he would sit in class and, and not do what he was supposed to be doing at school, but he could um, um, write this, uh, this code out and then he would take it home and he would type it into his computer um, in the afternoon. And uh, on the left, you can see uh, some of the artwork for the title um, called Donut Dilemma, which um, is also on the cover of my book, which I have here if you can see. Nick's family owned a donut shop and occasionally the machine would screw up. This was the inspiration for his game. So the premise for Donut Dilemma is as follows. Angry Angelo has raided Antonio's donut factory, seen the entire complex amok. Donuts have come alive and are jumping around in wild frenzies. Machines have gone out of control, throwing cooking fat, dough and sugar everywhere. We must help poor Antonio climb ladders, jump platforms and ride elevators to reach the top floor and shut down the factory's power generator, which will restore law and order. The game has 10 levels, including ladders and platforms, fat spurters, sugar sprinkler, cream blaster, ascending through the levels of donut factory chaos. And uh, whilst visually, you know, there's clear resemblance to um, platformers that we know and love, um, this is a, a really nice example, I think, of ordinary everyday life inspiring um, a game. This uh, isn't um, something that I'm trying to claim um, is typical. I think Nick Morentes is quite a remarkable um, homebrew developer and out there uh, largely um, on his own in that he is he was driving himself constantly to make um, original games and come up with novel ideas uh, sometimes he thinks to the detriment of um, the game's success because it was so uh, 
novel that people didn't have anything to to compare it to or, or know how to play. But um, you can read about that in the book. So this was um, this game was initially written in Z80 assembly language in 1984, which is nice. The same year as Desertos Volume One was translated into English for the TRS-80 Model One, but Marentes rewrote it in '86 in 6809 assembly language for color computers one, two, and three. So at what was effectively the beginning of the computer age for most people, users, many of whom were school-aged children and young adults like Nick, taught themselves to code and developed their own games and other creations. This is remarkable. It's not about how well their games were packaged, as I said at the outset. It's the fact that they were doing this that is significant. And I suggest it's the beginning of a vernacular digitality, the condition of living in a digital culture where ordinary users start creating born digital cultural artifacts. And yet, like other everyday practices in the home, such as cooking, the development of homebrew software is an activity um, that, quote, people consider very simple or even a little stupid. And that's from um, Giard's work on cooking in the home in volume two of practices of everyday life. So there are clearly questions of legitimacy here around the practice, around who gets to write games, you know, which are very interesting to, to consider and where it counts, you know, not in the home. One question um, it raises for me is if we've managed to overlook, largely overlook the ordinary culture of homebrew creation for microcomputers, because such practices were located in domestic space and therefore not obvious, because the activity was private and people didn't necessarily talk about it, or it was derided, and perhaps we've also lacked a discourse and or a discipline in which to describe and therefore grasp the significance of this activity, what else have we overlooked? What other uses of microcomputers in the period? Well, another practice that 1980s users engaged in, at least some of them, was hardware hacking. And um, I'm not going to go into this in any depth here, but I have some images that I'll just show you briefly that cover kind of the building, the hacking, and the repair of microcomputers. This is a favourite of mine, the, uh, the cover for the uh, Micro B Hackers Handbook with um, the uh, young person's monitor in a Canbrook kettle box. I'm not quite sure what purpose that's serving, but um, again, a lovely image of ordinary culture um, making do. It's been pointed out to me, oh, and this is the uh, the wonderful book by John Heilborn, Commodore 128, Troubleshooting and Repair, where um, it wasn't assumed that you had any knowledge apart from that you were reasonably handy and that you wanted to fix your computer, which um, always uh, makes me wonder how game I would be to open up my contemporary computer without much knowledge and just a, a will to get it done. So it's been pointed out to me um, a couple of times now that there's been more of a continental European discussion about such practices than in the Anglo world. But harking back to my earlier point about the disciplinary contexts, um, there's virtually no mention of such a user in any Anglophone fan studies scholarship where I would expect to see it. And so in Chapter 5, I argue that building and modifying computers, whether from circuit diagrams or a circuit cookbook or making up your own modification, constitutes a kind of engineering knowledge that some ordinary users clearly had, but that we haven't necessarily credited them with having. This user and their will to mod that I remembered I spoke about way back in 2012 at a Nordic DIGRA conference in Tampere has still barely made it into our accounts. Uh, have a read uh, of chapter five if you're interested. So I just want to um, wrap up then on this, this uh, question, I suppose, of, of ordinary making and a vernacular digitality. Um, I see homebrew game development in a long 1980s decade as exemplifying the beginnings of a vernacular digitality as per my title, where ordinary people make things with computers 
And I hope that this might be a concept that is useful for other people. I hope that we might start to venture questions about such making, both now and in the past, more often than we do. For instance, what are the characteristics and textures of vernacular digitality now? How have our ways of using computers for ends, not productivity related, developed and changed over the decades? Are users still able to find joy in creating with computers, given they are such a part of the workaday world? Many are engaging in hobbyist pursuits from high tech to traditional, and there's been a lot said about this um, during the pandemic. What questions should we be asking about such activities? And if relations between hobbies and paid employment are changing, how are they changing? In the midst of such concerns and uh, you know, such questions, the outlines of what I think of as a new subfield of hacking and tinkering studies are already discernible. So at a time when digital media are pervasive and proprietary hardware is increasingly black boxed and locked down, there seems to be significant pushback against the closed nature of computer environments and other consumer goods, unsurprisingly, perhaps. And scholars are taking contemporary tinkering and hacking more seriously, along with the urgent legal questions, for instance, that modding and the circumvention of digital rights management and TPN's technological protection mechanisms raise, um, which might be a neat segue to um, mention that uh, my next anthology that will be co-edited with David Murphy, in which Maria has also had some involvement with this tentatively titled Crafting, Hacking and Making. But I intend to you know, take these questions forward. So I might leave it there. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you for the wonderful talk. Uh, so now uh, we are looking at our uh, Twitch, YouTube and Facebook uh, feeds uh, to see if you have any questions, uh, our dear listeners. Uh, 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 so please, uh, if you have anything, I'm sure Melanie will be very glad to uh, try to answer. Um, for, for starters, uh, I, I have a question myself. I'm kind of uh, kind of interested. What are the next avenues uh, of your research uh, based on the material? Because you have so much material uh, from uh, from your uh, research that took really like almost twenty years uh, of um, of looking into the subject. So, so I'm interested if, if, if there is a sequel in mind, or you know, what what kind of what is the next thing for you? So, thank you. Um, as you know, I uh, have been working on a an ARC future fellowship funded by the Australian Research Council um, for a number of years. I was lucky enough to begin in 2014, um, and my project is. The successor project to this one, and it's called Creative Microcomputing in Australia between 1976 and 1992. So it really picks up the thread uh, from the homebrew hobbyist um, account, which emphasises you know people um, teaching themselves to code and and making it taking advantage of the facilities of the computer as a input output you know device to, to write games and asks the question, well, what else were people doing that was in some way creative making? Uh, and so I'm, uh, I have done a lot of archival uh, and interview-based research uh, in Australia and archival research um, internationally in an attempt to try to situate the Australian um, experience internationally. So looking at archives in the Silicon Valley um, archives at Stanford and the Victoria and Albert Museum going through the uh, catalogues of their computer art collection in the Patrick Prince archive. 
and so there will be a book um, coming out. Uh, I don't know when, in a few years. <laughs> Well, that is very exciting. Uh, very much looking forward. Uh, I remember my own uh, time with with your project, my one year postdoc, and it was really fascinating to see uh, your computer archaeology lab and all the all the materials and all the histories there. And it's always lovely to hear um, when you you know the way you tell the stories. It's just really lovely to hear. A wonderful storyteller you are. Uh, I, I, I really enjoyed your book. Um, so um, what do we have here? Um, Niklas is saying that we have no questions so far. Uh, Niklas, maybe you have a question yourself. Uh, Niklas Nelund is one of the uh, curators of uh, the Finnish Museum of Games. And actually, uh, maybe Niklas will have a chance later because now we have a question from Jakos Stenros from the Center of Excellence in Game Culture Studies, uh, University of Tampa. How do you see the connection between digital and non-digital homebrew games? Were there specific non-digital game traditions that influence early digital homebrew movements? That's a very good question, I think. That's a great question. Thanks, Yako. Um, the simple answer is I don't know. I have um, made microcomputer games the subject of my inquiries. So I didn't explicitly go looking uh, for um, for non-digital um, you know, board gaming traditions. I know there are some, um, and I know there are some specific uh, games. I mean, Brian Sutton Smith wrote a book on New Zealand string games and, um, you know, Māori culture and, and, and games and play um, quite some time ago. Uh, and, and a few um, unique titles popped up, but they're not ready at hand. I'd have to go back through my through my archives and um, and dig up details on those, I'm sorry. But yeah, wonderful. <laughs> a wonderful question. I do conceive of the the relation uh, between arcade console and microcomputing games as a kind of ecology. And it's clear that there were influences going, you know, between all three uh, and not just in one direction, interestingly enough. Um, so many homebrew developers in my study borrowed concepts from arcade games that um, they had played, and also uh, microcomputer uh, titles um, for a different um, brand of uh, computer that they couldn't, it wasn't available for their particular system, and so they wrote their own version of that. Um, but interestingly, in a case study that I published with a New Zealand collector uh, and historian, Michael Davidson, on the game Malzac, Malsec was coded on an Apple II, um, and it seems like it's initially it seems like it's a clone of Scramble. Um, but Michael raises point about the differences between the um, Scramble and Malsec gameplay that possibly it's actually a, a clone of an Apple clone of Scramble, if that makes any sense. And so things kind of, <laughs> you know, are going in all sorts of directions. Um, but I do think the idea of an ecology uh, of influence um, where influence circulates is a, is a useful one and perhaps uh, board games and, and non-digital games ought to have been in there as well. Thank you. Um, we have another question from the Code Show. Hi, Melanie. Uh, how do we embed this history into our educational curriculums so the societal and cultural impact is recognized? That's a good question. I don't know. Do you have the answer to that? The code show? <laughs> you guys are going around, as I understand, and showing um, contemporary uh, high school students, I take it, high school, uh, 
the machines from the 80s and presumably the titles that um, were available for them. So it sounds like you're doing that work. Um, I'm, I mean, we're working, I suppose, as uh, scholarly game historians at uh, making sure that this finds its way into the uh, academic histories of computing um, and and media, and often a lot of our work is is done in conjunction. Like, and I can speak uh, for Maria as well as myself in conjunction with cultural institutions who are keen to pick up the story and tell it. And so, you know, the Finnish Museum of Games is a case in point. I do quite a lot of work with the Australian Centre for the Moving Image here, and uh, they they have a, a homebrew game collection as a result of my research um, in this space. It, um, the work was um, also part of the Play It Again project, uh, which we, the first Play It Again project ran from 2012 to 2015. Um, and I was the project leader of that. We're now working on the second iteration of that. And I haven't um, uh, quite done the 1990s um, homebrew game research yet, <laughs> but um, please feel free to send me material if you've got leads and things that I should be looking into. I'd love to um, receive them. Great. Um, uh, we, we have a question from Jakos Swaminen. Um, uh, first of all, he says, uh, thanks, Melanie. Uh, what are the key factors producing differences in homebrew gaming cultures in different regions of one country uh, and between different countries? Um, again, a good question. I, um, I don't think I've got enough of a sample size to be able to generalise either on a national basis or regional basis. However, I would note some structural differences between the Australian and New Zealand case studies and the US and some European countries. And this is um, the relative availability and access to computers, pre-microcomputers. So in Australia and New Zealand, you just didn't get hands-on with a computer uh, until micros came along. There weren't computers in schools. Um, most of the people who we have interviewed who worked in the game development industry in the 1980s as part of the Play It Again project, they uh, cut their teeth on microcomputers. Um, I've been um, told by people that that is not the case in Europe, uh, in some countries in Europe at least. Um, Scandinavia, you know, mini computers were around. Um, I'm not sure how prevalent computers were in schools prior to micros. Uh, I know that we tried to um, get our micro B into schools in Scandinavia and did in some cases. Um, in the US, similarly, uh, I know from archival research that the People's Computer Company in Silicon Valley um, was making, uh, I'm not sure quite what they were, whether they were timeshare machines or, or, or what, available, you know, in the, in the 70s, much, uh, you know, some years prior to the, um, the emergence of the first micros. Uh, whereas in Australia, there was very little. I had a student doing a PhD on the history of educational software, and he found that there was one state that had some time sharing uh, facility available for computers in the 70s, and I think that was Tasmania. Um, that's about all I can say, Yako, about uh, regional differences. Um, but, yeah, I think that's an important structural difference between um, Australasia and other places. Most people didn't have much experience. They may have come across, um, you know, some PDPs or something like that at university, but Veronica Meegler, who coded The Hobbit, was, uh, I think, one of the only first-generation game developers working for a commercial developer. 
that is Beam Software, who had that that um, that experience. So it's that generation um, who's, who first encountered uh, computers at university uh, before micros. But by and large, yeah, it was um, it was micros for most people. Okay. Um, now we have uh, a question from Niklas Nelund, um, a question on preservation, uh, as uh, Niklas is the curator here at the Finnish Museum of Games. How important it is to actually play these games uh, to understand the homebrew culture? Is it enough to preserve the context in which they were made and the opinions of their makers? Um, what about archival material? Yeah, it's a it's a good question. Um, I have some gameplay footage, uh, and I thought about showing it tonight. I just thought that it might not work very well over all this distance and uh, be a bit shaky. Uh, the um, games uh, of Nicholas Marantis have um, have been taken by the Australian Centre for the Moving Image and are, as I said, part of the homebrew collection there and they can be played in an emulator. Um, I, I think it's important. So I would probably let me turn the question around a little bit. I think it's um, important for cultural institutions to recognise and value this practice, which I know you do in Tampere, um, but we don't want to give the impression that um, innovation and, and game development only happened in the industry, in, in official industry um, sanctioned places and workplaces, uh, because that clearly misses a whole aspect of the, um, of the vitality and the, you know, and the ongoing Vitality. So, I mean, the whole the question of of homebrew today is one that I take up as well in the book, in chapter seven and uh, and is it chapter six? Anyway, um, towards the end, and look at some of the um, amazing games that are being made for these eight bit microcomputers now. Uh, including a whole range of um, wonderful DMAX, um, which I have to credit Maria with um, opening my eyes to. Um, you know, perhaps they're as interesting uh, as, as documentation of some of the earlier games, you know, and they, they bring less, they bring fewer preservation challenges probably because people are able to uh, be playing them on their on their contemporary machines. But, um, yeah, it's a bit of an open question, really arguing about, well, what should we be collecting? Can't collect everything is my position. And, but, you know, we want to be thoughtful about what we do collect and what we are devoting resources to so that um, there's a good representation of a range of different practices, both industry and, um, and unofficial, such as homebrew. Okay, um, so maybe a follow-up question from me from more kind of institutional perspective, because you have a really impressive history of collaboration with different stakeholders. So I would uh, I would like to ask how, uh, since the first kind of Play It Again project, how your collaborations have evolved in Australia and uh, New Zealand regarding the preservation of this material? And how do you, like, what, what kind of changes you see um, in, in that collaboration? Uh, for example, does COVID change anything? Like, clearly, uh, this uh, lecture is something that maybe we wouldn't do, like, three years ago. So, like, I think there is more, like, accessibility now. Um, so, so basically, uh, uh, my question is how, how it all evolved regarding kind of institutional uh, support and collaborations with different uh, stakeholders. Thank you. That's a gift of a question, Maria. Um, the, you were at, as was Jaco, the first uh, 
Born Digital Cultural Heritage Conference that we ran in Melbourne in 2014 in the before times. Um, and, uh, you know, it was a very intimate um, gathering of 50, 60 people from Australia and internationally who were able to come and had the, the commitment to come. Um, I'm pleased to be able to say that we're about to run the second iteration of that conference um, next month uh, from the 16th to the 18th of February and it will be online and free. And I just advertised it on Friday and already there's you know, more than 120 registrations from all around the world. So I think this is going to be, a, obviously it's going to be a completely different beast, um, but it's an exciting thing to suddenly from our small contained, um, you know, f feeling like we're at the end of the world, um, um, endeavours uh, with, you know, friends and networks in the game history space around the world uh, and certain archives who we talk to, suddenly we're going to have conversations that are going to be happening with many, many more players and intersections and, and practices and, and institutional, you know, it's, it's, I don't quite know what to expect, but I think it's going to be really exciting to, to experience that scaling up, that radical scaling up. Um, I can also say that uh, from the early experiments and the early research that we did, um, with uh, industry partners uh, such as ACME and the New Zealand Film Archive. We are currently, um, we've been evaluating emulation as a service uh, in Australia and we have a, a, an instance of easy running now on um, Google Australia Cloud, uh, which is really exciting. We're going to be Fingers crossed, offering a game for play on the open web, uh, one of the 90s Australian um, made games um, for a couple of weeks for people to, I suppose, experience what the lag is like from Europe <laughs> and North America, uh, not like we normally experience it. Um, so instead of jet lag, we'll be talking about the lag between um, and, and the latency and the pings and all the rest. Um, but I think the, um, the provision of emulated content online is only going to become more important, um, as is the conferencing and the um, connection and the sharing with people on the other side of the world virtually uh, in an era of climate change. Um, so... It's really important that we figure out how to do this and that we do it as well as we can um, and make it as much uh, fun as it can be. So you'll be pleased to know we're not having 20-minute papers at the, uh, at the Bourne Digital Cultural Heritage Conference. We're having five-minute presentations with discussion to keep it as lively as possible. So, um, yeah, lots of changes. Um, and I'm also really pleased to be able to say that we'll be scaling up our emulation as a service infrastructure um, install in Australia, extending it to something like 15 um, university and GLAM institutions over the next two years. We um, were successful with an infrastructure bid to the Australian Research Council um, that was announced just before Christmas. And so this is going to be a huge um, step forward for not just game preservation but software preservation. Um, in this country and, and hopefully it will provide a model that other people will be able to pick up and, and run with um, wherever they are uh, of how, you know, we can collaborate to, to make content accessible. Well, thank you very much. Looking very much forward to the conference. Um, uh, I think we, we are closing to one hour uh, so uh, thank you very much melanie for your time uh for the wonderful lecture thank you thank you for all the questions from our audiences
Um, this um, recording will be available, uh, well, the stream will be available, archived on the uh, Finnish Museum of Games uh, YouTube uh, channel. In the description, uh, we will uh, post links uh, to uh, all the different uh, projects uh, Melanie was talking about, so you can experience that lag. Uh, and enjoy the rich uh, cultural uh, heritage of uh, homebrew culture and, and and digital culture of uh, of Australasia. Uh, so uh, thank you very much, Melanie, once again. Uh, thank you uh, to Niklas Nilund from the Finnish Museum of Games and Jukka Kaupinen for being our uh, stream streaming officer. Uh, here and uh, and yeah and I see you see you everyone uh, next year because we would like to continue uh, this this lectures uh, as in kind of annual uh, annual event. Uh, Melanie, thank you very much once again. Thank you.